Now in this chapter, I want to go through the Azure Container Instance Service. So in the earlier chapter, we had seen how we could deploy a container based on an image we had published onto Docker Hub. So this was a .NET Core application. Over there, we went ahead and deployed a container on a Linux VM. Now let's say that you want to go ahead and deploy a container just for testing purposes. So yes, you can go ahead onto your local machine. You can go ahead and see if the containers are working in your development environment. But let's say you want to go ahead and see or publish the container from the image on basically another platform. And let's say you don't want the burden of going ahead, creating a Linux VM, installing Docker, and then pulling down the image and seeing if it works. So what you can do is that you can actually go ahead and make use of the Azure Container Instance Service for this purpose. This service provides a fast and simple way to go ahead and deploy your containers. Here you don't need to provision any VMs for hosting your containers. Here the containers get their own fully qualified domain name and IP address as well. The Azure Container Instance can actually go ahead and create containers based on images that are available in Docker Hub or even in an Azure Container Registry. So let's see how we can accomplish this. So here we are in Azure. Now I'll go on to all resources and let me go ahead and add a new resource. So over here, I'll go ahead and search for container instances. I'll go ahead and choose that. I'll go ahead and hit on create. Over here, I'll go ahead and choose the resource group. I'll go ahead and give a name for my container instance. So it is available. I'll go ahead and leave the region as it is. Now over here in the image source, you can go ahead and choose quick start images, which are available in the Microsoft registry. Or you could go ahead and choose Azure Container Registry, or you could go ahead and choose Docker Hub. So over here, let's go ahead and choose Docker Hub. And let's go ahead and specify the name of the image that we have in Docker Hub. Over here, you can go ahead and specify what should be the underlying OS type. So this is basically the OS which will be used for hosting the Docker environment. So remember in the background, that entire compute, that entire virtual machine, which is hosting Docker, the Docker host is going to be managed. It's going to be a managed service when it comes to the Azure Container Instance service itself. Over here, you can go ahead and choose the size for the underlying VM, that is the Docker host. I'll go on to next for networking. So I'll leave everything as it is. Over here, you can see you can assign a DNS name label. Over here, you can see the port mapping. So I'll leave it as port 80. I'll go on to next for advance. I'll go on tags. I'll go on to review and create. And let's go ahead and create the container instance. Let's come back once we have the instance in place. Now, once you have the container instance in place, if I go ahead on to the resource, over here, I get a public IP address. So let me go ahead and take the public IP address and go on to a new tab. And over here, you can see the home page for your application again. So you're going ahead and deploying it onto the Azure Container Instance. Over here, if you go on to containers, so over here, you can see the state of your container. If you go ahead and scroll down, so let me go ahead and just hide this. And over here, you can basically see events. So if I go ahead and just scroll this on top, so you can see all of the events. So over here, it went and pulled the image. It successfully pulled the image and then it started the container. If you go on to properties, you can see the different properties. Over here, you can see the image that was pulled down from Docker Hub. If you actually go on to the logs, over here, you can see the actual logs of the container itself. So what's happening within the container, you can see the logs over here. And then you can actually go on to connect and you can also go ahead and connect on to the container itself. So over here, if I go ahead and hit on connect, over here, I'm actually connected onto the container. If I go ahead and do a LS, 
over here I can see my application files. So in this chapter, just want to let you know that if you want to go ahead and have an easy deployment service for your containers, it's a managed service, you can go ahead and make use of the Azure Container Instance. Now in this chapter, just for the benefit of students, I just quickly want to go ahead and talk about layers. So when an image is pulled down, whether it be from Docker Hub or whether it be from another registry, it goes ahead and pulls down various layers for that particular image. So actually when you look at how an image is built, an image is built based on multiple layers. You have multiple layers that actually go ahead and form that actual image. For example, if you have an Nginx image in place, over here you might have the base image has a layer, which is probably the lightweight OS version of let's say Ubuntu, just giving an example. The next layer would involve having Nginx now deployed onto the base image. And you might have one more layer wherein you have the configuration files that is probably required for Nginx itself, some additional configuration files. So over here, your base image is mostly the OS. And then on top of that, when you make any change, so let's say you're going ahead and adding files. If you are going ahead and installing something on the base image, it will go ahead and create additional layers. Every change that you make will actually go ahead and create an additional layer. But then the Docker system actually makes all the layers just seem has one seamless file system to you. So it will go ahead and pull the layers and make it has one image to you. So you don't have to be bothered about the layers themselves. So what you have to ensure is when you go ahead and build a Docker image using a Docker file, then you have to ensure that your image is not that large in size because the entire idea is to have a packaged version of your application as light as possible. So even when it came to building our own Docker image using our .NET Core application, over there we probably had a base image of again Linux. Then we had one layer for having the ASP.NET Core runtime. And then we had our application has another layer. Now, when you go ahead and have an image, so all the layers are basically read only. When you go ahead and create a container out of that image, then the container will have one layer on top of all the other layers. So these are all the layers. This top layer will actually be a writable layer. So if you want to go ahead and let's say write any sort of information that is required by the container, so this could be files, this could be data that is required by the application, you can go ahead and make it available on the writable layer. But once the container is stopped, once the container is destroyed, then this writable layer is not available anymore. You can actually go ahead and persist data onto volumes. That is something we will see in later on chapters. But just to go ahead and explain that concept of layers, just want to let students know when it comes to working with Docker. Now in the next set of chapters, I actually want to go ahead and explain about the instructions which is available basically in this Docker file. Now in order to go ahead and explain these instructions, let's go through the manual way of building a Docker image rather than using Visual Studio. So firstly, what I'll do, I'll go on to my solution. So currently it's in the path of C temp Docker app. So let me go ahead and open the folder in file explorer. So over here, I've got my Docker app in place. Over here, if I go on to Docker app, I have my Docker file in place. Now, let me go ahead and publish my project 
has an application that can be deployed just on my local machine. So I'll go on to my project, I'll right click, I'll go ahead and hit on publish. And over here, let me go ahead and create a new publish profile. Over here, I'll just choose folder, I'll go on to next, and over here in the bin release folder, it will go ahead and create a published version of our application. I'll go ahead and hit on finish. And let me go ahead and hit on publish. So this will go ahead and do a build of our project to ensure that we have a deployable version of our .NET Core application. Please, at this point in time, we are not using the Docker file. We are not going ahead and creating an image so far. We have gone ahead and created a runnable version of our .NET Core application. So now if I go on to the bin folder, if I go on to release, if I go on to the publish folder, so over here, I can see the artifacts which can be now deployed onto a web server. Now let's say I want to go ahead and create an image out of this. So let me go ahead and just open up Notepad. I'll go on to Visual Studio. Let me go ahead and copy all of these instructions. I'll go on to Notepad and over here, let me go ahead and save this file. I'll go on to the temp directory. I'll go on to my Docker app. So I'll go on Docker app. I'll go on to bin. I'll go on to release. I'll go on to my publish folder. And over here, let me go ahead and specify Docker file. So now I'm going to go ahead and have these instructions in place for creating an image. I'll go ahead and hit on save. Now over here, we don't need most of these statements. So I don't need these set of statements over here. Over here, what is important is to go ahead and expose port 80. I don't even need to go ahead and expose port 443. Over here, I do need my from instruction. So over here, the from instruction basically provides a link onto the base image. So based on what do you want to create your application image? You need to go ahead and base your application image on some sort of base image. So over here, we are using the base images which are available by Microsoft. So over here, when you're looking at ASP.NET 3.1, this contains or this image contains the required runtime for running your application. So remember that you will have now that base image of ASP.NET 3.1. This will be used for hosting your application. And then you'll have your application itself, your DLL. And this will become your image. Your DLL will be running in this runtime. So we need the from instruction in place. The work directory command can be used to go ahead and specify a working directory for your container. Now let me go ahead and just copy the expose statement a little bit later on so that we have better clarity on our statements. Now we have our working directory in place. We now need to go ahead and copy all of the files in this publish folder onto our image. So over here, I can go ahead, I can go ahead and remove this from statement since I already have a from statement over here. I can go ahead and remove this working directory. And now I can go ahead and use the copy command. So now I can go ahead and copy everything from my current folder onto my working directory. So over here, I said we're copying everything from our current directory because our Docker file is basically located over here. So we want to go ahead and copy everything right from here from our current directory onto our working directory, which is slash app. And then I'm going ahead and exposing port 80. And over here, I'm mentioning the entry point. So I want to go ahead and run docker app.dll as soon as the container is launched. Let me go ahead and click on save. 
So even if you go on to the published version of your .NET Core application, over here you can see you have a Docker app .dll, right? So over here we have gone ahead and formulated our Docker file. Now let's mark an end onto this chapter and let's go on to the next chapter wherein we'll go ahead and build our image. So now in the last chapter, we had gone ahead and created a Docker file that will be used for creating an image out of our application. Now at the moment, we have not gone ahead and created the image. So now let me go on to command prompt or we can go on to PowerShell. So over here, I'm in command prompt. So let me go on to Docker app, CD Docker app. Over here, I need to go on to the bin folder, right? And then next, I need to go on to the release folder. And next, I need to go on to netcode app 3.1. And then I need to go ahead on to the publish folder. And over here, we have our Docker file in place. Now to go ahead and build an image, we have to go ahead and use the docker build command. Over here, we are giving a name of the image. So we're going to go ahead and create an image with the name of my app. And over here, we are saying that please use the current directory has the context for building this image. In this current directory, we also have our docker file in place. So I'll go ahead, copy this command and let's paste it over here and let's do a docker build. So over here, it has gone ahead and now created an image. Over here on my local system, if I do a docker image ls to go ahead and see all the images. So over here, I have my docker app image. I have the one which is tagged to my repository. I have one that is tagged onto my dev environment. I have Nginx and now I have my my app image also in place. Now I want to go ahead and publish this onto Docker Hub. So over here, I need to first of all go ahead and log into Docker onto Docker Hub. Now it is authenticating with existing credentials. If this does not work, go ahead and do a Docker logout and then do a login again. Now over here, I am going to go ahead and tag now my image. So I'm using the Docker tag command. So it's like having different versions for your images. You can go ahead and version your images with the help of tags. So you might have image version one, image version two, etc. Over here, let me go ahead and copy this command. So currently my app is with the latest tag. And if you don't go ahead and mention a tag, so over here you can go ahead and mention a tag of let's say V1. So let's say this is V1 version of your application. You can go ahead and mention that has the tag over here. Then you can go ahead and push this onto Docker Hub. Now, since we have gone ahead, let me go ahead and modify these commands. Since we've gone ahead and specified V1, if we didn't specify any tag by default, the latest tag will be taken. Now let's go ahead and push this image and tag onto Docker Hub. So now it's going ahead and pushing it onto our repository. Let's wait till this is complete. Right, so this is complete. Now, if we want to go ahead and verify our application is working as it should, our image is fine. We can actually go ahead on to Azure and let's go ahead and create a new Azure container instance. Over here, let me go ahead and choose again container instance. Please note you can't go ahead and change the containers for your existing container instances. You can make your container instances pull down newer versions of your images that you've already specified, but you can't go ahead and specify a different image for a container instance. So over here, I'll go ahead and hit on create. 
I'll go ahead and choose a resource group. I'll give a name. Over here, I'll choose Docker Hub. Over here, let me go ahead and give the name, right? So it's my app and V1. I'll leave everything as it is. Networking also has it is. Advanced, tags, review, and create. And let's go ahead and hit on create. And let's come back once we have the container in place. Now, once I have the container instance in place, I'll go ahead on to the resource. Over here, let me go ahead and copy the public IP address. I'll go on to a new tab and we can see the home page for our application. Everything works as it should. Right, so this marks the end of this chapter. Now, in the last chapter, I had mentioned that when it comes to Azure Container Instances, you can go ahead and make sure that it pulls the latest version of your image, right, which is available in Azure Container Instances. Now, the way that you can actually do that is to go ahead and ensure that you have a newer version of your image available. So let me go ahead on to Visual Studio. Over here, let me go on to Pages. I'll go on to the index page and over here let me go ahead and make a change. So over here let me go ahead and say welcome to Docker. I'll go ahead and save everything. Now again I'll go ahead and hit on publish. I'll publish onto the folder. Now once this is done, if I go ahead onto my local machine, now, currently, I said that the Azure Container Instance can only go ahead and point onto one container at a time. And currently, we have actually gone ahead and pointed it onto V1. That's the tag. So, we have to ensure that even now the change that we have is made onto the same image tag. What you can do is that you can actually go ahead and have multiple tags for your images. So you could have a V1 tag and you could have a latest tag as well. And you can go ahead and push both onto Docker Hub. And then you can go ahead and always ensure that the Azure Container Instance takes the latest version of your image. Since I was just trying to explain to you how you can create a tag for your image, that's why I'd used an option of V1 or version one. But you can have multiple tags for your images. Currently, since my Azure Container Instance points on to V1 from my app, that's my app image. Let's go ahead and keep it as it is. Now, currently we are in the publish folder. Now, what happens if I go ahead, right, and do a build of my project again? to create an image. So if I go ahead and do this, so it has gone ahead and create an image. Over here, let me go do a Docker image LS. And over here, I can see my app that is latest that was created 30 seconds ago. Now I already have my repository slash my app with the tag of V1. So I have to first go ahead and delete this image so that I can go ahead and tag now my latest image with my repository name. So for that, I can go ahead and do a Docker image RM. And over here, I can go ahead and give the name of my image, basically, which is shaken Steve slash my app v1. So it's gone ahead and deleted that particular image. So if I do a Docker image LS, I don't have it in place. Now again, I can go ahead and tag my image, my latest image. Then I can go ahead and again push the image onto Docker Hub. And while this is being done, let me go on to my container instance and let me go ahead and hit on stop. 
once it is docked over here let's wait till it is pushed on to docker hub right so it's pushed let's go back on to the container instance and let me go ahead and hit on start so now it should go ahead and pick up that image again pull down the image again from docker hub and remember our image should be having now the newer version of our application now once my container instance is running it will actually be allocated a new public ip address so let me go ahead and take that public ip address and go on to a new tab and over here you can see our new application in place welcome to docker so in this chapter i just want to explain to you how you can make a change onto your application and then publish that image onto docker hub Now in this chapter, I want to go ahead and now give an explanation on to the Docker file that gets generated by Visual Studio. Now this is known as a multi-stage build or a multi-stage Docker file. Over here, the different from statements that we have actually go ahead and define the different builds in this Docker file. It actually helps to go ahead and create a more leaner image. So remember earlier on what we had done from Visual Studio, we had gone ahead and published our application. That publish would actually be done by building the application first and then doing a publish. And then we had a very small Docker file and using that Docker file, we went ahead and created our custom image now this particular docker file does everything for you it does the build it does the publish and then it goes ahead and creates an image so we are doing everything has one operation over here instead of manually going ahead building our application publishing our application we are doing everything via this docker file so as you can very well imagine when looking at the statements when it comes to building and publishing your application it is done with these set of statements so in these set of statements it is first going ahead and using the image which has the SDK, the Software Development Kit for version 3.1 of .NET that is used to go ahead and build your application. Because remember, if you want to go ahead and build a .NET Core application, you need that SDK in place. So over here, it is going ahead. It's creating an environment to build your application itself by using this particular image then it's going ahead and copying the project files doing a dotnet restore copying all of the files after the restore operation is complete and then it's doing a dotnet build on to the build folder then it is going ahead and using that particular stage which it just created and is then doing a dotnet publish so over here these are all the internals which are done automatically by visual studio whenever you go ahead and build your dotnet core application so once these stages are actually complete so then we come on to the final base stage over here so in this final stage it is going ahead and taking the artifacts from the publish stage over here once it has gone ahead and copied the artifacts which are in the publish folder it will go ahead and dispose of these images or these containers it's not required anymore because see the sdk is quite a big image so this image was only being used to go ahead and build your application it's not required anymore once the artifacts have been copied on to the final stage of the docker file it then just goes ahead and ensures that all of the files are in place 
and then we have the entry point statement. The entry point says, please go ahead and run our application when the container is started. So over here, this is the concept when it comes to using a multi-stage build in your Docker file. Over here, you're building your application and then you're going ahead and creating a runnable version of your application. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I want to go through Azure Container Registry. So, so far we have been publishing our images onto the public Docker Hub registry. But if you want a private registry only in Azure, you can go ahead and create an instance based on Azure Container Registry. So over here in all resources, let me go ahead and first create an instance of the Azure Container Registry. Over here, let me go ahead and search for Container Registry. So I'll go ahead and choose that. I'll go ahead and hit on create. Over here, I'll go ahead and choose a resource group. I'll go ahead and give a name for the registry. So it's not available. Right, I'll leave the other things as they are. I'll go on to networking. I'll go on to encryption, tags, review, and create. And let's go ahead and hit on create. Now let's come back once we have the container registry in place. Now once the deployment is complete, I can go ahead on to the resource. And over here, if I go on to repositories, so currently I don't have any repositories in place. Now I'll go on to Visual Studio. So let me go on to my index page. Over here, let me go ahead and make a change. So I'll go ahead and say, welcome to Azure Container Registry. I'll go ahead and save everything. Now I'll go on to my project. I'll right click. I'll hit on publish. I'll go ahead and create now a new publish profile. I'll go ahead and choose Docker Container Registry. I'll go on to next. I'll go ahead and choose Azure Container Registry. I'll go on to next. Over here, I'll go ahead and choose the registry that we just created and let me go ahead and hit on finish. And then let me go ahead and hit on publish. Let's wait till this is complete. Now once the publish is complete, so if I go ahead and hit on refresh, now I can see my repository in place. So now you can see that it has also gone ahead and attached the latest tag. Now let's go ahead and create now a container instance based on this repository. So I'll just go ahead and open up all resources in a new tab. And before I go ahead and create the Azure container instance, there's one thing I need to do for my registry. Over here, I need to go on to the access keys. And over here, I need to go ahead and enable the admin user. So this is required when you want to go ahead and pull out images from the Azure Container Registry. So I'll go on to all resources. I'll go ahead and click on add. I'll go ahead and again search for container instances. I'll go ahead and hit on create. Over here, I'll go ahead and choose my resource group. I'll go ahead and give a name for the instance. Now I'll go ahead and choose Azure Container Registry and over here we can go ahead and choose our image and the tag. I'll go on Networking, Advanced, Tags, Review and Create. Right, so everything is in place. It's port 80 over here. Let's go ahead and hit on Create. And let's come back once this is complete. Now once deployment is complete, I'll go ahead on to the resource. I'll take the public IP address. I'll go on to a new tab. And over here, you can see our application is running. So the only difference is that we have gone ahead and published our image onto a private container registry in Azure.
Now in this chapter, I want to go through the mounting of volumes, which is available for your containers. This can be used for persisting your data. So earlier on, I explained that when you go ahead and create a container out of an image, out of all of the readable layers of the image, when it comes to the container, you get a very thin writable layer. Now, whatever data you write on this layer will be destroyed once the container is stopped or even when the container is removed in the end. So if you want to go ahead and persist data, so you want data to be there even after the container is not present, then you can actually go ahead and mount a volume onto the container. So in Docker, you can actually go ahead and create volumes those volumes will be persisted on the underlying disk of the system. And then you can actually go ahead and write data onto that volume. So let's go ahead and see how we can accomplish this. So these are the commands we are going to go ahead and execute as part of this chapter. So first using the Docker commands, we are going to go ahead and use a Docker volume command to create a volume. Over here, we are going ahead and giving a name for the volume. Over here, then we can go ahead and list the volumes just to ensure that we have the volume in place. Then we are going to go ahead and run a container. Now this container will be based on the image of Ubuntu. And please know that we are going to go ahead and make use of Linux containers, right? So we're going to go ahead and launch Ubuntu on our Ubuntu subsystem, which is running on our Windows system. So over here, I'm using the image of Ubuntu. So we'll create a container based out of this. Now we are going to go ahead and run this both in the daemon mode, so it'll run in the background. At the same time, I'll also go ahead and run in interactive mode so that we can actually go ahead and interact with the underlying container. Over here, I can go ahead and now use the mount flag to go ahead and mount the volume that we created earlier on. And then we can go ahead and say that, please go ahead and target a mount point of slash app for this particular volume. So remember, this is a Docker volume that will be residing on, let's say, the hard disk of my workstation. And this volume is going to be mapped onto the container. Within the container, there will be a directory called as slash app. And then we can go ahead and write our contents over here. When we go ahead and write the contents onto this directory, remember it is being written onto the hard disk, which is attached onto my computer. So that's the idea over here, you're creating a volume and then you're going it and assigning it onto a mount point onto the container. Then we'll go ahead and attach on to the running container. So over here, we have to go ahead and get what is the container ID. And then we can go ahead and write a file onto the container. This time it will be written onto the volume. So let's go ahead. So firstly, let me go ahead and create a volume. So here on my Ubuntu subsystem, I've gone ahead and created the volume. Then we can go ahead and list the volumes. So we have the volume in place. Now let's go ahead and run a container based on the Ubuntu image. So since it's not able to go ahead and find the image locally, it will go ahead and download the image onto the local system. So let's wait till this is complete. Now, once this is complete, let me go ahead and list down the containers. So over here, I can see the container ID. So now let's go ahead and use a docker attach command to go ahead and attach on to this running container 585. So now I'm logged into that Ubuntu container. If I do an LS, so over here, you can see we have the 
app mount point or the directory over here so let's go on to it so i'll go on to cd app and over here let's go ahead and write some contents onto a sample.txt file right so i have the file in place right so this is a container now remember this is going to be written onto my hard disk on my computer now if you want to go ahead and see where these volumes are created so you can actually go if you're on windows system you can go on to wsl dollar this will actually go ahead and direct you on to that subsystem the windows subsystem for linux over here i can go on to docker desktop data version pack data community docker and the volumes now please note that i've seen in a lot of forums that this is not the exact location for the volume so even for me it took some time to actually figure out where the volumes are stored on my system so i've not seen a very consistent location for the storage of the volumes but then when i searched my system this is where i actually found the volumes so if I just go ahead on to Windows Explorer, over here I can see my volume in place and over here I can see my txt file. So I said now this is being persisted, has a volume on my local system. So now what we'll do is that let's go ahead and exit from here. So I'm back on to my Ubuntu subsystem. Over here let me go ahead and again see the running container. So I don't have the container in place. So as soon as I exit from the container, the container has stopped. Now let me go ahead and see all of the containers, right? So I have my Ubuntu container in place. Now let me go ahead and remove the container, right? So it's removed. So if I go ahead and look at the containers, I don't have the container in place. But remember, we still have our volume in place. So over here, let me go ahead and again run the container command to create a container based on the Ubuntu image. Over here, now it should have mapped onto my volume. So let's go ahead and see our running containers. So it's 25C. So let's go ahead and attach onto this container. Right now here we should be having again our app folder and let's go ahead and see the contents and I can see my sample.txt file. So the entire purpose of this chapter is to let you know if you want to go ahead and persist data you can actually go ahead and create volumes in Docker. Now in this chapter I want to go ahead and show you how you can create a container based on the MySQL database. So the MySQL database is a popular SQL based database and when it comes to developing workloads on containers, so you have your front end which could be a .NET Core application which could be a Java based application and then you have your back end where is your data being stored. So your data could be stored in a SQL Server database, in an Oracle database, in a MongoDB database, in a MySQL database. So one of the most popular images or containers when it comes to a data store is MySQL. So this is a database that you can actually go ahead and use as a container. So over here, I'm going to go ahead and use the docker run command. Over here, the name of the image is MySQL. So if you go on to Docker Hub, there is an image with the name of MySQL. Over here, I am giving a name for the container. So it will be MySQL instance. Over here, I am just giving an option to restart on any sort of failure. I am saying please go ahead and run in the background. Over here, we can actually go ahead and set environment variables. So when it comes to this particular Docker image, you can actually go ahead and specify various environment variables. Over here, I'm just saying that please go ahead and set the root password. So you can actually go ahead, you know, by default, there'll be a user known as root. 
that will be created when you go ahead and create a MySQL instance. Over here, you can go ahead and make use of this environment variable, which is predefined. So it's MySQL underscore root underscore password. And over here, you can say this should be the password for the root user. So let me go ahead. I'll execute this command in my Ubuntu subsystem. So let me go ahead and run this command. So I think I'm still in the container as per the last chapter. So I'll exit from here. Now let me go ahead and run the command to run my Docker container. So since it does not have the MySQL image locally, it will go ahead and pull the MySQL image from Docker Hub. Now, once this is done, so I can see I have a container based on the MySQL image. So once this is done, let me do a Docker PS, right? So I can see my MySQL container in place. Now I can go ahead and use the Docker execute command to go ahead and execute a command to the container. Over here, I'm using the interactive mode. I'm giving the name of my container and the command I'm actually executing is MySQL. So normally when you go ahead and deploy a MySQL database, it will also go ahead and have the MySQL client in place. The MySQL client allows you to go ahead and log into the database itself, the database server. So over here, MySQL relates to the MySQL.exe or the client that can be used to log into the database server. Over here, minus u means to go ahead and specify a username. So over here, the username is root. So please know that if you're not familiar with MySQL commands, this is the way you can actually go ahead, or one of the ways you can actually go ahead and log into the database server. Remember our database over here is being run in a container now. And over here, slash p means we need to go ahead and enter the password. So let me go ahead and run this command. And the password is azure, one, two, three. And here we are logged into MySQL. And remember, this is MySQL not running on the Ubuntu machine. It's running within a container on my Ubuntu machine. Over here, you can see all of the databases which are in place. Right, so in this chapter, I just want to go ahead and show you how you can have a MySQL database instance running in a container. Now, in the last chapter, we had seen how we could create a MySQL container based on the image. We went and we logged into the MySQL container. We executed some commands. Now, let's say you want to go ahead and expose the ports of the MySQL container so that you can actually go ahead and connect onto that MySQL database server from Visual Studio. So for that, we are going to go ahead and execute the same command, but over here, we're going to go ahead and do a port mapping. So the reason I have gone ahead and separate these two concepts is because again, I want to go ahead and emphasize, you know, how containers actually work when it comes to the networking aspect. In the previous chapter, the MySQL, you know, container was running in isolation. Even over here, it's running in isolation. But over here, we are now exposing the port so that we can actually go ahead and connect onto the MySQL instance from, let's say, Visual Studio on our local machine. Later on, we are going to be looking at how to deploy multiple containers using Docker Compose, wherein we'll have our container running in a .NET program and a container running MySQL. And how do we allow these applications to talk to each other within the containers itself? Over here in this chapter, I just want to go ahead and show you how you can connect from a .NET program in Visual Studio that's running on your local machine onto this MySQL instance container. Now, currently I have my MySQL container running in place. So let me go ahead and stop all of the containers I have currently. So let me go ahead 
and do a direct container removal over here let me go ahead and put the name of my container so saying you cannot go ahead and move a running container so what you can do is that you can go ahead and put the flag of hyphen s to go ahead and remove the container and let me go ahead and also remove the other container as well i don't need that container actually in place so over here that name of the container is sql app so now i don't or should not be having any containers in place so i have the ubuntu and the nginx that should be fine so let me go ahead and clear the screen so now let me go ahead and start this container now on my ubuntu subsystem for linux not on the container i'm going to go ahead and install the mysql client So over here, let me do an app get install MySQL client. So right now I've installed MySQL client on my Ubuntu subsystem. Now over here, I won't run the docker execute command. Instead, let me go ahead and now directly run the MySQL command. So let me go ahead and copy this command. I'll paste it over here. Now over here, the difference is I need to go ahead and mention what is the host name, which is basically the localhost IP address. Right, and we're connected onto MySQL. Now over here, since this is a new container, we don't have again our data in place. Please know that again, you can go ahead and actually mount volumes for your MySQL database. Over here, let me go ahead and run all of these commands again, just to ensure that I have the database and the table in place. And let me come back once I have everything in place. So once I have all of the data in place, so now in Visual Studio, I have a .NET program in place. This is a similar program we had seen earlier on. I had actually gone ahead and developed a simple program to connect or get a list of courses from a Microsoft SQL Server database. Over here, now I am going ahead and getting it from the MySQL database. So over here, everything remains the same except for the packages and the classes I'm using. So if I go on tools, if I go on to NuGet Package Manager and manage NuGet packages for the solution, over here, I'm using the NuGet package of mysql.data. And over here, I'm going ahead and using the classes that pertain onto mysql. Over here in the connection string, so I'm mentioning what is a server, that is my host, what is the user, what is a password, and what is the name of the database. So let me go ahead and run this program. So over here, you can see you're getting the list of services from the courses, and it's going ahead and picking up this information from the MySQL database. So remember, as a developer, you might go ahead and deploy a MySQL container on your local machine that will be hosting data. And before you can actually go ahead and deploy a Docker container with your application, in this case, let's say our .NET Core application. Obviously, from Visual Studio, we will first go ahead, develop debug and make sure the application is working. Because remember, in the end, your container is just a deployment environment. It's not your development environment. You will still first go ahead and develop your application and then deploy it as a container. Now, in this chapter, I just want to go through a use case 
when it comes to working with blobs and when it comes to working with containers. So you've seen earlier on how we could go ahead and use Docker to go ahead and run your containers. Earlier on, we had also seen that we could go ahead and persist data onto volume. So we could go ahead and attach a volume onto a container and data could be written onto that volume. So over here in this chapter, I want to go ahead and take a blob that's known as courses.json from one of my storage accounts, which is in the data container. So if I go on to Azure, I have a storage account in place. If I actually go on to my containers, if I go on to the data container, over here I have a courses.json file in place. If I go on to edit, so these are the contents of that particular file. So what I'm going ahead and doing is that I'm going ahead and using the blob classes to go ahead and download the file from the storage account. But this particular program is going to go ahead and run in a container. So we're going to go ahead and create an image out of this application using Docker file. So I've already gone ahead and basically added Docker support for this particular project. Over here, I've gone ahead and chosen Linux has the underlying Docker support platform. And over here, we have the normal Docker file in place. Over here in the program, I'm saying that please go ahead and create the blob in the local app folder. So that app folder will be basically our target mount point over here. We are going to go ahead and create a new Docker volume and then we'll go ahead and run that container using that particular volume. Now let me go ahead and publish this onto Docker Hub. Now over here, I already have a published profile in place that will go ahead and publish this as an image onto Docker Hub. So let me go ahead and hit on publish. Let's wait till this is complete. Now once the publish is complete, if I go ahead and just refresh the page for my repositories. So over here, I can see blob project in place. So over here, let me go ahead and first create a new volume. So over here in one of my sessions for Ubuntu, let me go ahead and create the volume. And then over here, let me go ahead and create now the container out of that particular image using that volume. Right, so that is done. Now, if I go ahead and do a Docker PS, so over here, I can just see the container. This is basically on my development environment. So I could go ahead and stop this actually. Once this is done, if I go ahead and do a Docker PS and see all of my containers. So over here, you can see the blob project based on my repository in Docker Hub. It ran, it also exit 53 seconds ago. So what happens that container would just go ahead and download the blob and then it would go ahead and exit. But just to confirm that the blob was downloaded. So in Windows Explorer, let me go ahead onto the volumes. Over here, let me go on to blob volume. I'll go on to data. And over here, you can see the courses.json file. Right, so everything is in place. So in this chapter, I just want to go through a use case scenario where you can go ahead and download blobs in a container using volumes. Hi and welcome back. Now in the next set of chapters, I'm going to go through Docker Compose. So this is a tool that can help you define and run multi-container Docker applications. Over here, you can go ahead and make use of a YAML configuration file to define what are the containers that you want in the running state. Now, in large organizations, if they want to go ahead and deploy applications as containers, they might have many containers that need to be deployed, especially if the application is following the microservices architecture.
When you go ahead and look to following the microservices architecture, then you'll go ahead and expose each functionality has a service. So let's say that you have a customer service, a service that gives you order information, a service that gives you information about the products. And then you have an application that goes ahead and consumes all of these services. You then go ahead and deploy each service has a separate container. If you try to go ahead and deploy one container after the other, it's a nightmare. Even for me, even if I'm just trying to go ahead and manage two or three containers, it's quite difficult. If you want to go ahead and just deploy them one by one, it takes time. So what you can do is that you can actually go ahead and make use of something known as a Docker Compose file. So this is a deployment mechanism that is available from Docker. Over here, you'll go ahead and specify a YAML configuration file. That YAML configuration file will go ahead and define the services and the containers that need to be deployed. Now we're going to go ahead and see how to deploy a simple Docker Compose file for just a database service. And then we'll go ahead and see how to have a Docker Compose file for both an application and a database service. Now over here in Visual Studio Code, I've just gone ahead and opened up one of my local folders. Over here, I have something known as a Docker Compose YAML file. Now, if you want to go ahead and download and install Visual Studio Code, you can go ahead and do that. This is a light editor when it comes to developing applications. Over here, you can go ahead and develop your .NET, even your Python-based applications, your Java-based applications as well. So you can go ahead and download this tool for free. So over here, I have a Docker Compose YAML file in place. Now, if you want, you can go ahead and install the recommended extensions for Docker Compose as well. So if I go ahead and hit on install, so in Visual Studio Code, you can actually go ahead and install something known as extensions to go ahead and extend the functionality of Visual Studio Code itself. Over here, it has gone ahead and installed the Docker extension so that you can actually go ahead and work with Docker files, with Docker Compose files, etc. So going back on to my Explorer, over here, I have my Docker Compose file in place. Over here, I'm mentioning what is the version of the Docker Compose that I want to go ahead and use. So if you actually go on to the Docker documentation, over here, you can look at the matrix when it comes to the different Compose file format versions. Now over here, I'm going ahead and defining a service. So I'm saying I want to go ahead and run a container as part of the service. So you can go ahead and define various services over here. Then I'm going ahead and giving the service a name. And then I am saying, please go ahead and create a container based on the image of my SQL. Over here, I'm doing a port mapping. I'm saying that if there is a failure, go ahead and always restart. And then I mentioned that if you want to go ahead and specify environment variables, we had seen this early on when we went and spun up a container based on MySQL. There we had gone ahead and specified the MySQL root password. There are other environment variables as well. So if you want to go ahead and specify a MySQL user, its password, what is the database, etc. Then over here in the volume section, I can actually go ahead and tell MySQL, the container basically, go ahead and run all the scripts that I have in the init folder. So over here, you can go ahead and pass it on to the default, you know, file that gets executed, the entry point file that gets executed when MySQL container starts. Over here, you can say that please go ahead and execute all the scripts I have in my init folder. So over here in the init folder, I am saying please go ahead and create a course table and please go ahead and insert data. So as soon as my container is up, I'll have this data in place then I don't need to go ahead and actually keep on entering the same data. So now let's say I want to go ahead and now create my services, create my containers based on this Docker Compose file. 
So firstly, I'll go on to my Ubuntu subsystem. So over here, I can see I'm on an existing MySQL. I'm connected on to an existing MySQL container. Let me go ahead and exit. Let me go ahead and see all the containers that I have. So I do have this running container in place. Let me go ahead and forcefully remove this container. Right, let me go ahead and see all of the containers. So I only have the Ubuntu and Nginx container. That should be fine. So now I want to go ahead and run this Docker Compose file. Now remember over here, I am actually connected on to my Ubuntu subsystem, which is running on my Windows system. And over here in Visual Studio Code, all of these files are in my C colon temp2 directory. Now, if you want to go ahead and browse onto this directory from the Ubuntu subsystem, it's very easy. Over here, let me go ahead and just clear the screen. So over here, I can actually go on to the MNT folder. And over here, if I just do an LS, so I can go on to my C drive. Then over here, I can go on to my temp2 folder. And over here, I have my Docker Compose file. So from your Ubuntu subsystem, you can actually go on to the contents in your C drive. Now over here, you just go ahead and execute the Docker Compose file. You can go ahead and use the command of Docker Compose. So let's go ahead and do that. So now it's going to go ahead and take the commands which are in the Docker Compose file and it's going to go ahead and now deploy a MySQL container. Right, so now it is ready for connections. So remember over here, we are now deploying our container via a YAML configuration file. It's making it much more simpler now when it comes to deployment of containers. So now in another Ubuntu session, if I go ahead and just look at my container so I can see a container is running. Now remember we had gone ahead and installed the MySQL client on this Ubuntu subsystem so it should be available. So let's go ahead and connect now onto the MySQL container. Now over here I'm going to go ahead and use this MySQL user and the password is Azure. So over here let me go ahead and mention the username and password and now I am connected and now over here if you go ahead and show databases you can see you have your AppDB database in place let's go ahead and use AppDB show tables we have our course table in place And over here, you can see all of the information. So now we've gone ahead and ensured that in addition to our container being up and running, we were also able to go ahead and pass in a script that would go ahead and set up the data in the underlying database. Now in this chapter, I want to go ahead and show you how you can use Docker Compose to go ahead and deploy both your database as a service and a .NET web core application also has a service. So over here in my temp folder, I have a Visual Studio project in place. So I'll just go over and double click on the project file. So again, this contains or consists of my ASP.NET core application, which goes ahead and fetches all the details from the course table in a MySQL database. So we've seen this earlier on as well. So there's no changes over here. So if I go on to my services, if I go on to the core service, so over here, this goes ahead, uses the MySQL classes to go ahead and fetch data from a MySQL database. Now over here in this particular project, I also have a Docker file. So I've just gone ahead and created my own version, a simpler version of the Docker file, wherein I'm again making use of multi-stage builds. Over here, again, I'm going ahead and using the SDK to go ahead and create that build environment, copying the files, running .NET Restore, and then going ahead and doing a publish. 
and then finally going ahead and building the runtime image. So this is my Docker file. So Docker file will go ahead and take my .NET Core application and bundle it up as a custom image. Now over here, I also have the Docker Compose file. Over here, the services for the database remain the same. So over here, again, when it comes to the volumes, I again have the init folder. So as part of my project, again, I have the init folder and I have the SQL file to go ahead and create the table and add the data into the table. Going back onto my Docker Compose file. So over here, I have the DB service, which will be running. And I also have the web service now as well. Over here, I'm telling the web service, please go ahead and use the Docker file, which is in the current context, that is in the current directory, to go ahead and build the image which will serve our web layer. So this Docker Compose file is going to go ahead and also now build our custom image based on the Docker file. This will be for the web layer. For the MySQL, we already have an image in place. Over here, I can go ahead and give a depends on clause saying that the web service depends upon the availability of the DB service. Over here, I'm going ahead and doing a port mapping so that I expose port 80 of my web application. And over here just has an extra scenario. I'm going ahead and creating a new Docker network. So you can go ahead and create new networks in Docker. Over here, I am just going ahead and telling to create a new network known as App Network. And then over here in the environment for the web service, I'm saying the DB host is DB. That is basically our DB service over here. What is the port number 3306? Now, if I go ahead and scroll on top, so my service for the database is named as DB. So if I go on to my course service over here, in the connection string, so the very important, in the connection string, you have to know what you have to place as a server, what should be the host name. Over here in the host name, I'm now going ahead and giving what is a service that is specified in the Docker Compose file. So this is important. So let me go on to my Ubuntu subsystem. Let me go ahead and exit. Let me go ahead. Sorry, let me go ahead and just see the containers that I have. Let me go ahead and stop all of my containers. So I'll go ahead and remove the container as well. Right, so once this is done, let me do and see all of the containers. So only Ubuntu and Nginx, that should be fine. Let me go ahead and clear the screen. Again, I'll go on to my MNT folder. I'll go on to C drive. I'll go on to temp2. Over here, I have everything in my MySQL project. Over here, I have my Docker Compose file. So let's go ahead and create our services while the Docker Compose file. So over here, it's going ahead and building my web layer first. So it'll go ahead and first build the custom image that is required for the deployment of my web layer. So let it go ahead and carry out all of the required tasks. So I can see that my web layer is now started. And now it's going ahead and initializing my database layer. Right, so everything is working as it should. Now in Chrome, let me go on to localhost. And over here, if I go on to port 5000, over here, I can see my application in the running state. So my container is basically listening on port 80 and I've gone ahead and mapped it onto port 5000 of my local machine. So now I can go ahead and browse to my application via a different port number over here. But now you have your web layer running as a container and you have your database layer also running as a container. If you actually go on to your Docker desktop dashboard, if you go on to containers and apps, over here, you can see an entire project in place based on the Docker Compose, based on the name of my project. 
and over here you can see a separate web layer and you can see the database layer. Right, so in this chapter, I just want to show you how you can use Docker Compose to go ahead and start two containers at a time.